All right, good afternoon, everyone. Good. Welcome to the White House for the Asian American and Pacific Islander Business Leaders Briefing. I also want to welcome those that are watching online on our live stream at whitehouse.gov slash live. My name is Eddie Lee, and I am the Associate Director in the Office of Public Engagements. And it's my role to be your liaison and your voice here in this White House to uh, serve you in every way that we can. Um, about 27 years ago, my parents came to this country uh, with very little access to networks, with very little money in their pockets. But they came with a simple belief that if they worked hard, if they followed the rules, that they can enter the middle class, that their children, who turned out pretty well, can uh, have a good education, and that they can also have a better life than themselves. Uh, and I'm assuming that many of you and your parents and your parents' parents came to this country with that same ideal, uh, that our generation, and I say it very endearingly, that our generation, that we can have that opportunity in the future to achieve the American dream. But part of assuring that promise of America uh, that, we, that this country stays strong is making sure that our economy is built to last, that it's making sure that our jobs are there for those that want them, and that the rungs of the ladder of opportunity expand rather than grow narrow. And so all of you play a very important role in that. Whether you're a small business leader or a leader in the business or private sector, all of you are very important. And that's why we've invited some of the preeminent leaders across this country here to this briefing. It's because of you that we are able to create more jobs. And it's with the work that you're able to do in your own local communities that you're able to make this community and this country that much stronger. And so with this briefing today, we want to accomplish three things. One is to talk to you and share with you what this administration has done so far and our plans moving forward with the business community. But also, we, all want, to, we want to hear from you. You all know firsthand how to create those jobs. You know firsthand how to start your own businesses. And we want to hear your concerns, your suggestions, your questions. And so I encourage you to be vocal about that. But more importantly, this is an opportunity for us at this White House to thank you. Uh, I, I know very well firsthand that it's because of the sacrifices that you've made for your family, for your community, for this country, that we're able to be as strong as we are today. During my job here, as I walk through these halls, I think about every single day about uh, business leaders like those that create their own laundromats in Los Angeles, who have put aside their own ambitions and their own dreams so that their children can have a better, better future. I think about the nail salon owners who breathe in dangerous chemicals every day, work overtime every single day, so that they can ensure that their family can grow on and become prosperous, and that this country will become a better country. And I think about all of the leaders here in this room on whose shoulders I believe I stand on. It's the work that you do in your communities that make me, uh, allows me to be here today in this White House and to be your voice for this community and to become an advocate for all the work that you do. And so for that, I want to thank you all from the bottom of my heart. So why don't you guys give yourself a round of applause. Today we have a, a lineup of some of the strongest and uh, the most admirable leaders throughout this White House and this administration. And the first person that I want to bring up is someone that I respect very dearly. He is a mentor of mine, someone that I believe is the epitome of public service, and that is Chris Liu. He is the assistant to the president and the cabinet secretary. And it is in his role that he is a liaison to the cabinet departments and agencies helping to coordinate policy and communication strategy. It's in his role that he makes sure that the cabinet is, has a laser-like focus on creating jobs. And it's in his role also as the co-chair of the White House Initiative on Asian American Pacific Islanders to ensure that our community has a voice. And I'll tell you firsthand that every single time I meet with him, the question he asks is, what more can I do? How can I be a, be a, a, more, a stronger advocate for all the Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders around this country? And there's not been a single time when he said no, because he understands how important every single one of you are and how important it is for us to go out into your communities and to, to be at this White House to ensure that you all have a voice within these halls. And so with that, it's truly a pleasure, truly an honor to bring up Mr. Christopher Liu.
Thank you, Eddie, for that wonderful introduction. Eddie, as you all can see, is really one of the superstars around here. Uh, he's only been here for a couple months. He was at the Department of Education before this. Uh, Eddie and I first met each other back in the snowy days of the New Hampshire primary. And you could even see back then, this is a kid who's got great potential. So all of you are so lucky to have him working for you. Let me just welcome everyone to the White House and tell you what a, a pleasure it is to see so many old friends. Uh, I, I got kind of swarmed and took a lot of pictures at the beginning of this. And uh, somebody asked me beforehand, are we going to have an official photographer? And I said, look, if you're doing an event with AAPIs, you kind of don't need a photographer because I'm fairly sure everyone brings their own camera. So. I was just reminiscing. I, uh, the first time I was in this building was, uh, Eddie was just talking 27 years ago, his parents came to this country. 25 years ago, I was in this building. Uh, I was invited to a similar briefing for Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders back in the Reagan administration. And while I didn't obviously agree with a lot of the things the administration was doing, even back then, it really instilled in me uh, an understanding um, and a deep appreciation for the power of government. And so I'm glad that I could be here to help you share all of this. Now, as Eddie mentioned, I serve as the co-chair of the White House Initiative on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. And I am privileged to serve in this capacity with our wonderful Secretary of the Education, Arne Duncan. As many of you know, back in October of 2009, President Obama reestablished the initiative. And since that day, we've had one primary mission, which is to figure out ways that the federal government could do more and could work more effectively on behalf of our community. And to do that, it has been critically important for us to hear from all of you and hear your suggestions about how the federal government was and wasn't serving your needs. So over the past two and a half years, the hardworking staff at the initiative and the commissioners have traveled around the country doing events like this. We've done hundreds of events in about 50 different cities, and we've reached more than 25,000 people. And I always say, if we haven't made it to your city yet, uh, just be patient. I guarantee you we'll be there soon. We've also published a guide to the federal resources that are available to the AAPI community, and those were handed out on the way in, so hopefully you have a chance to look at that. Uh, you can also get copies of that on the website and learn more about what the initiative is doing at whitehouse.gov slash AAPI, whitehouse.gov slash AAPI. Moving forward, we really want to continue this face-to-face -face dialogue and engagement. Over the coming year, we're going to be holding uh, regional action summits in communities across the country that are going to be focused on helping AAPI small business owners like yourself, better able to navigate the resources of the federal government and better able to understand uh, ways to access capital. Uh, in fact, just over the next month, I'm going to be traveling to Jacksonville, Florida, Atlanta, Georgia, and I, wherever else Eddie tells me I'm supposed to be going um, to, to, to talk to all of you. Um, and we've also, uh, just so you know, we've also added you to our email list, so you'll be getting updates of um, the different events we have around the country. And I'm making a shameless plug because three weeks ago I finally got on Twitter. And I was at an event like this, and I, I literally had zero followers. Um, but it was a group of like 100 like, high school kids. And I said, look, I better be at 100 by the end of the day. Um, and so I did get to 100. So I encourage you to follow me on Twitter. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, I'll do my shameless plug not only to you, but everybody watching on the live stream. It's uh, Chris Lou 44 Chris Liu, 44, and we tweet every single day about the work that the uh, president is doing, not only on behalf of APIs, but on behalf of all Americans. Now, all of this engagement is important because we know that these are difficult times in our country, and we know that we can't leave any stone unturned in trying to find more ways to help API small business owners, workers, and students. Indeed, in the President's State of the Union address two weeks ago, he talked about how this is a make or break moment for the middle class. Now, a few months ago, I was in Las Vegas giving a speech to about 500 APIs, and we were at a local union hall. And I started listing the problems that the middle class has been facing over the past couple of years. And in this largely blue collar uh, audience, I could just see heads nodding up and down. Um, if any of you are from Nevada, you know full well um, this is a state that has the highest unemployment rate. 
It's a state that has the highest foreclosure rate. So they understand all too well the problems facing the middle class. But whether you're from Nevada, whether you're from another state that's doing far better, you know that the economic security of the middle class has been eroding for decades. Even before the recession began, good jobs and manufacturing have been leaving our shores. And while some have profited and done quite well during this downturn, most of us haven't really, uh, particularly as we find the costs we're facing, whether it's education, whether it's health care, continuing to rise while our paychecks stay flat or go down. So fortunately, under the president's leadership, the economy has made great strides, as you all saw in last Friday's jobs numbers. Over the past 23 months, we've added 3.7 million private sector jobs. We've also had 10 straight quarters of economic growth. American manufacturing is creating jobs for the first time since the 1990s. The American auto industry is coming back. The president has signed a landmark health care law that will provide insurance to 30 million people who don't have health insurance and will provide greater security to hundreds of millions of others who do have insurance. And the president has worked hard to improve our schools and in particular make higher education more affordable and more accessible. So whether you're a recent immigrant or your family has been here for several decades, you know that there's a basic promise in this country, that if you work hard, you can afford to buy a house, you can raise a family, you can send your kids to college, and you can start to build a nest egg. But to keep that promise for everybody, we really need to build a new kind of economy. We need to build an economy that's not based on artificial booms, that really is based on manufacturing more in this country, providing the job skills to a worker so they can compete for the 21st century, to ensure that we have a clean energy economy that not only fosters energy independence and provides good paying jobs. And most importantly, we need an economy that's based on hard work, on fairness, and on responsibility. And all of you know those are just core values in our community. The success of the economic plan that the President has laid out and which my colleagues will be talking about is important to all Americans, but it's especially important to our community. Let me just give you a couple of facts. One quarter of a million AAPIs have been out of work for more than six months. 40% of our students attend community colleges, and that's why if we want to work on job training, we have to concentrate on community colleges. One out of every six Asian Americans lack health insurance, which is why the President's health reform bill is so important. The President has pushed for a payroll tax cut. That would provide a tax cut to 7.5 million AAPIs and provide an average tax cut of $1,000. And there are one and a half million small businesses in this country, people like yourselves. Now, let me tell you a little bit of facts about small businesses that you might not know. The president fully appreciates the role that all of you are doing. All of you may know this, but two thirds of the new jobs created this, in this country are created by small businesses. And that's why over the past three years, he has signed into law 17 tax cuts for small businesses. Now, I'm not being partisan, but if you go to our friends on the other side of the aisle, they're never going to tell you about those 17 tax cuts. But that's 17 tax cuts, and the president has recently proposed four new tax cuts for small businesses. He's looking for ways to help small businesses gain access to capital so they can hire more employees. And he's looking at ways to streamline regulations so that more immigrant entrepreneurs can enter this country and create businesses. All of this is in the President's economic plan. These are the things that my colleagues are going to talk to you a little bit more about. And I encourage you to learn more about this. And if it seems like a great idea, I encourage you to talk to your network, your friends, your neighbors, your colleagues, and tell them about the work that we're doing here. So in conclusion, let me just thank you all for being here. I know your time is valuable. I know that when you're not in the office, you're probably not earning money. Um, and so this is time away from that. So we hope you get a lot out of this. Um, I'm confident you will because we have a great set of speakers ahead of us. And let me just say this, there's no better person to kick off this event um, than our next speaker, uh, Mike Stromanis. Um, he is one of the President's closest and longest serving advisors. Um, he has known the President for many, many years. 
He worked for then Senator Obama as his chief counsel. And over the past three years, he has worked for the president's senior advisor, Valerie Jarrett, first as chief of staff, and now counselor for strategic engagement. It is fair to say that Mike has been involved in virtually every single policy issue that has come through the White House. But it's not just his policy knowledge uh, that distinguishes him. If any of you have had a chance to interact with him, you will know that what truly distinguishes him um, is his personality. Um, he has a complete loyalty to the president. He understands that his job is to make the president look good and not make himself look good. He has a remarkably calm demeanor uh, when the rest of us are running around with our hair on fire. Uh, and he has a wonderful sense of humor that I'm sure you will uh, find out very quickly. Uh, he and I have worked together for seven years. We've been in the trenches for a very, very long time. Uh, and there's nobody else I would like to go to battle with uh, than Mike Stratmanis. So please welcome my good friend, Mike Stratmanis. Thank you, Chris. And, uh, I, you know, I, I, obviously, um, Chris and I are good friends. Uh, that was a very kind introduction. And, uh, and I would, frankly, as far as leadership um, in the White House, I I'd say the same thing about Chris Liu. Um, I will tell you, frankly, the president wouldn't be where he is without him. Uh, he has been at his side um, since, the, since Barack Obama came to Washington, D.C. Um, he's a pretty low-key guy, um, but don't let that fool you. Uh, Chris is a tough, disciplined, seasoned advisor um, and is doing work that uh, would make all Americans proud uh, at really extolling the highest uh, level of public service. So let's give Chris another round of applause, please. <laughs> Since we're going into battle together, it sounds like I might as well say a couple nice words about him, too. <laughs> so good afternoon, everybody. Welcome and welcome to the White House. Thank you for joining us. Look, I, I, we have some people who have been working very hard uh, with the business community. So I, I want to give you a, a very simple message uh, and then let's get started. I, I want to say thank you. And, and I want to say thank you from a, a couple of different perspectives. The first, as you've heard, um, I've spent a little bit of time with President Obama. Uh, you know, we were in Chicago together, actually, and, and you don't spend too long in Chicago without realizing the power of the AAPI business community. Uh, you know how they drive the culture. Uh, we know how they drive the economy. And, and when you think about everything that this president is working so hard to accomplish, job creation, long-term American competitiveness, creating an economy where everybody uh, plays by the same rules, does their fair share, and gets a fair shot. You all are at the forefront of putting that into practice and have been long before uh, I got into public service. And so really for establishing the values that have made this economy strong and that have made this country great, I want to thank you. Uh, for the strong, overwhelming engagement that you've uh, given this president, as you've worked with us in the trenches, I want to thank you. Chris just went through the accomplishments that we accomplished together at one of the more difficult times in our country's history, politically and economically. I hope you're proud of what you've accomplished. I hope you're proud of it because we have a lot more work to do together. Uh, we really are just getting started. And, and yes, we had tremendous uh, job numbers. It's, it's wonderful every time we see that unemployment rate goes down. But you know what that means. That means one more family and, and more parents who can provide what they need for their children. It means another group of people who can pursue their dreams. It means a community that's a little bit stronger, a little bit healthier, because it has economic vitality. So you know what a job means to someone. And it means that you don't have to make that, uh, you know, the vice president talks about the longest walk any parent can make. And it's that walk up the stairs to the home to tell their family they just lost a job or they don't know how they're going to pay the bills. Being able to, to turn this economy around, being able to create opportunity for everyone is what the president has worked so hard on. And, and I just want to thank you for being there with him by his side. But, but, but more than that, the fact that you're here and willing to engage with us shows the amount of faith and, if I could borrow a word, hope in the face of tremendous cynicism in our government right now. You know, a lot of people feel like uh, uh, at this time we really can't 
move forward, that our problems are too large, that, that this really can't, the 21st century can't be the American century the way the 20th were. And I know you believe differently. And so we're going to sit here and we're going to talk to you about uh, everything that we're doing to work with the business community to create jobs. We're going to talk to you about the export economy. We're going to talk to you about manufacturing. We're going to talk to you about the small businesses. And I know any small business in here doesn't want to stay a small business. You want to be a medium-sized business, and then you want to be a large business. I know there are some big business owners here. We're going to talk about how this government is going to help you do that as well. And, and, and I think I, I, I will ask of you uh, one thing, since I've already said thank you for uh, all that you've done. I'm only going to have one ask for you. Don't have this conversation stop here. Uh, yes, follow Chris Liu on, twi on Twitter, please, <laughs> so he can stop talking about it. <laughs> but, uh, but I want you to also uh, tweet about your experiences here today. Talk about it at church and in your places of worship. Talk about it at your homes. Talk about it in your business community. Tell people that we came here, you came here, we listened to you, and we gave you the information and the tools that you need to provide opportunity and good paying jobs to everyone in your communities and your cities back home. Let people know the good news about the hard work that's going on here at the White House. Uh, and we're going to continue to believe in you and work for you and move things forward. The last thing what I want to do uh, before, I, before I bring this, uh, uh, turn this over to this young man, uh, I, Eddie Lee, I've had an opportunity to see him work. First of all, we know he works hard. Um, uh, you, know, you know he works hard because you get those emails from him at 1 o'clock in the morning. So hard work is, is something that uh, I think comes very easily to him. But it's the way he does it and the heart that he brings to it. When he walks around every single day, this is, these are not academic discussions to him. This is not just a job to him. He brings his family. He brings his parents. He brings those who sacrifice to allow him to have this opportunity to serve his country in with him every single day. He inspires us. Uh, and I know he's going to continue to inspire you. Eddie, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. That's the way you get more work out of people. <laughs> <laughs> I guarantee he'll send me an email afterwards. <laughs> Let me just return that favor to these two gentlemen who spoke before me. You know, these, you don't have to look further than these two men to know what this administration and the heart that they have to serve our country, to serve this community. And every single time I get to sit in the room with them, I understand what it means to be a public servant and what it means to be a leader. And so we're so honored to have them here in this White House. And I want to just give them another round of applause. Um, at this time, we have uh, an amazing opportunity to hear from leaders across this administration, from the SBA, the Small Business Administration, from the Department of Commerce, and the White House Domestic Policy Council. And these are folks that work day in and day out to make sure that your voices are heard, to make sure that you are given the resources that you need, and to make sure that you all are standing on a strong and a solid platform. Um, at this time, I want to invite them up here and, and ask them to, to, to prepare themselves. Uh, but this is an opportunity for you to uh, both listen to them about the work that they do, but more importantly, to ask them questions, to voice your concerns and your thoughts, and to just let your voices be heard. Uh, uh, and, and also for those that are watching online, this is your opportunity to get involved. If you're on Twitter, uh, we want to welcome you. If you're not on Twitter, then we want to welcome you to the 21st century uh, to do so. But if you are on it, uh, you can do so. You can engage in this conversation by using the hashtag AAPIWH, AAPIWH. And, and I know we are very limited on time, but we will try to take as many of those questions via the, the internets as possible. So with that, I want to turn it over to Mr. Chris Chan, who is a special advisor in the, in the SBA, and, and just want to actually thank him for all the work that he's done to actually make this event possible, because it's, it's his leadership that uh, really allows us to engage our small business leaders, as well as business leaders across this country. So let's give him a round of applause, as well as our panelists. <laughs> Thank you. 
Uh, well, thank you, Eddie, and uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us here today. Um, as Eddie mentioned, I am uh, Chris Chan. I'm a special advisor at the U.S. Small Business Administration, um, and I'm here to help moderate a fantastic panel that we have. Um, you have representatives um, from across the federal government here to talk to you about what um, what we're doing in the federal government, what we've done in the federal government here in the last couple of years to try and help business leaders across the country. Um, so. Enough from me, um, we're just gonna jump right into this and I wanna take this opportunity to introduce Malcolm Lee um, to my right. Malcolm is counselor to the Secretary of Commerce and the director of the department's Office of Policy and Strategic Planning. Before joining the Obama administration last June, Malcolm worked for Microsoft in China and the, U uh, and the US. Malcolm served in President Clinton's White House as special assistant to the President for International Trade and e Economic Policy and in the Department of State as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State. Uh, Malcolm, I think you're going to tell us a little bit about some of the work that the Department of Commerce is doing. Is that correct? Sure. Would you like us to use a podium? Or? Uh, if you'd like to, more okay. than welcome. Great. Thank you. It's a, it's a great, great honor to be here. Uh, I see some friends from the Asian American uh, community here, and uh, I know a number of you for, from small businesses. I, you know, my family, uh, I'm sixth generation Chinese American, um, and uh, came from small business roots. Both, my, uh, both of my grandparents were uh, uh, small business people in the Chinese community. My mother's father grew up in, my mother grew up in Chinatown. She was, uh, her, her father uh, was head of the Chamber of Commerce of Chinatown. They had a, a little store that sold ducks and soy sauce chickens and produce right on the corner of Mott and Bayard. It's, uh, it's still there today, it's no longer in their hands. And uh, my father was, uh, you know, born in, a, in one of the two Chinese laundries that, uh, that uh, uh, they had in, um, in New Haven, Connecticut. Um, you know, my dad went to, uh, served in World War II, went to college on the GI Bill, and ended up working for a pharmaceutical company. I, I ended up, he went to the University of Connecticut, I ended up going down the street uh, in New Haven to uh, the college that, uh, that uh, Yale, um, and when he was in college, to get, get through uh, college, he, uh, he, uh, he bought a hearse. There was a funeral home across the street, and he would drive and pick up Yaleys, drive them down to New York on the weekends, and that's, that's, that's how he supplemented. <laughs> so, um, we've got, uh, so we've got some, some good business roots, and uh, you know, the Asian, Asian American community is my own community. Um, you know, even though we're a number of generations old, uh, you know, we've tried to be active where we can. My wife was, was uh, the first executive director of the Asian American, National Asian American Bar Association. Um, and um, and I, I, I worked uh, for a time after law school for ALDEF uh, on their immigration subcommittee and have come in and out of government since then. Um, you know, I think my, my, own, my own passion for public service must come from my mom who, who uh, retired at the age of 84 uh, about three years ago as she was a counselor and social worker um, helping uh, underprivileged youth and uh, disturbed youth um, first in the public school system, but after Title I was, was cut by Reagan in, in, 19, uh, in the early 80s, she went to work for a, a parochial school. Um, so it's a, a great pleasure to be here, and um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what the Commerce Department does. Um, you know, we are very focused on uh, two things, um, jobs, creating jobs, and helping you sell what you make, and uh, we're all about growth. Uh, you know, we... Uh, I was asked to come and serve. I've only served since this past June. Secretary, Secretary Locke, now Ambassador Locke, who many of you know, uh, came and asked me to serve it, to lead his um, uh, uh, policy and strategic planning department. And, um, and Secretary Bryson uh, asked me to stay on uh, when he came on. And we are, we are about, he has, Secretary Bryson has one major theme, um, and it's building it here in the United States and selling it everywhere. And we're, we're determined to do this by focusing on three areas. First is manufacturing, as the President outlined in the State of the Union. Second is exports. And the third is investment, encouraging more companies uh, uh, to invest here in the United States who are already here, U.S. companies and foreign companies to invest in the United States as well. And we're, in, we're in a very different world than even when I served during the Clinton administration. I think we're in a, in a world that... Um, we have many more competitors. The rest of the world is, is rising, and that's a good thing. Um, but we have to think differently. And this president and this secretary and this administration are, are, are really committed to uh, 
preparing us for the future. You know, on manufacturing, why, why does the president focus on manufacturing? Nearly, nearly 12 million Americans have manufacturing jobs, and, and many of them are in small and medium-sized businesses. Every job inside a factory supports two more outside of it. And manufacturing is also the biggest source of innovation. 67% of all business R&D in America is done by manufacturing companies. Uh, President uh, recently named uh, Secretary Bryson, uh, Secretary of Commerce, and Gene Sperling to head the White House Office of Manufacturing Policy. And we've created at the Commerce Department a new national program office to lead the President's Advanced Manufacturing Initiative. And this initiative is going to bring together, it's going to be locally based. It's going to focus on partnerships between businesses, universities, local government with some federal government money uh, to help seed uh, manufacturing strengths around the, the special expertise of localities. Um, some, some, some are concerned about industrial policy, but this is going to be top up. We take, we're going to work with communities on their expertise and help develop manufacturing hubs uh, locally. They'll drive investments in emerging industries like information technology, biotech, and nanotechnology. Uh, the Economic Development Administration, which is part of the Commerce Department, has, in the last two years alone, has already invested 68 in 68 competitive job-creating projects across the country to support advanced manufacturing. And our National Institute of uh, Standards and Technology, NIST, uh, plans to invest nearly $90 million in advanced manufacturing. Now, the President, in his State of the Union, highlighted manufacturing. And there'll be more details coming out in a week as he announces his budget. But it's all focused on uh, strengthening local partnerships, creating jobs locally, and creating competitiveness locally. The second area, as I mentioned, is increasing our exports. We have to export because 95 of, America's, 95 of consumers are outside of the United States, and only 1% of U.S. businesses exports. Of that 1%, 58% sell to only one country, Canada and Mexico. So this is an enormous opportunity. The President has announced, uh, launched two years ago, a national export initiative as to design to help businesses overcome these hurdles. And we've had some success. Um, U.S. businesses have expanded exports, you, 17 percent in 2010 and 16 percent so far this year. And we're on track to meet the President's goal of doubling U.S. exports by 2015. But we have to intensify our efforts. You know, Europe is, uh, has some challenges. Um, and. Uh, because of the macroeconomic challenges, we're going to have to redouble our own efforts. The President signed three free trade agreements. He's, and we're finding uh, creative ways to partner with businesses to find to, to increase exports. SBA and others are, are, are partnering very closely with, with small businesses as well. Uh, we're reforming our really obsolete export control system, which was based on a, a vision of the world which no longer exists, a, a Soviet-centered and we'll pay special attention to removing overseas trade barriers to our companies. It's essential that we have a level playing field. This President, this Secretary, uh, Ambassador Locke all believe that given a level playing field, our companies can compete with any companies in the world. Our workers are as good as any. Uh, tourism is considered statistically an export. Um, and this, this President you know, has uh, understood that increasing imports, increasing tourism from the countries whose middle classes are rising, China, India, Brazil, is really quite vital. Uh, and we've made some progress. He's announced an executive order uh, just two weeks ago in Florida on tourism. He wants us to produce, a, we're working with the Secretary of Interior and with across the administration to produce a national tourism strategy in less than three months. Um, we haven't been waiting for the strategy to move. You know, over the last uh, increasing non-immigrant visa processing ca uh, capacity in China and Brazil by 40% in 2012, by 2012 is one of our goals. And uh, the President is also committed to ensuring that 80% of non-immigrant visa applications are interviewed within three weeks of receipt of application. 
that are very long visa lines in places like China and Brazil. Um, but we've recommitted resources to those markets. And over the last, uh, uh, in the fiscal year 2011 alone, more than a million visa applications in China were adjudicated and more than 800,000 in Brazil. And that represented a 34% growth in China and a 42% growth in Brazil. So we've got to rise to meet the demand and, and uh, addressing these visa problems is a, is a large part of it. Finally, uh, I've, I've talked about uh, manufacturing and investment and, uh, and exports, and now I'll talk a little bit about um, attracting foreign investment. Again, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, uh, America was the investment place of choice. Lots of investment, first from the Europeans and the Japanese, but right now, with, with the emerging markets rising, uh, investors have a lot of choices. The federal government has never really focused on competing for that investment. Uh, and this president announced an executive order last summer, um, and we created a, called Select USA, where we're going to align federal resources to help facilitate and attract and promote investment into the United States. Um, foreign companies already support five million jobs in America and employ American workers in every single one of our 50 states. Uh, so this, this will also be a, a very high priority of ours. Um, so I will, I'll turn it over to SBA and I can welcome any questions you have on, on these priorities or on U.S.-China relations as well. Thank you. Thanks, Malcolm. Um, I think we're just going to jump straight in um, to our next speaker, uh, Michelle Chang, who is um, uh, Deputy Chief of Staff at the U.S. Small Business Administration. Um, she's part of a leadership team that oversees over 2,000 employees and a variety of policy areas. Uh, before this role, Michelle was most recently serving as senior advisor at SBA's Office of Government Contracting and Business Development. And I think you're going to talk to us a little bit about um, what SBA has to offer uh, for resources to business owners. Absolutely. Thank you, Chris. And I am going to sit here because I'm expecting a little one. So <laughs> I think sitting will be better for me. So, um, First of all, I just want to say I'm very excited to be here today and to talk to all of you. Um, similar, I think, to many of you all, I have a story about why I'm here today. Um, I'm, the parent, I'm the daughter of two parents who immigrated from Taiwan, so I'm first generation. Um, I'm just very excited to support Asian Americans. It's, very, it's a topic I'm very passionate about, and also small businesses. Both my grandparents um, had small businesses. My grandfather had a textile wholesale manufacturing company. My other grandfather owned a doctor's practice. And without their hard work and all of the work that they had done, there's no way that my parents would have able to have the opportunities that they had here and then for me to have these opportunities here. And I'm just very excited to work on behalf of small businesses and all of you in this administration. Prior to joining the administration, I worked in the private sector. and learned a ton there, but I always felt like something was missing, and that was that sense of public service and giving back. And so every day, what I'm trying to do is to work on behalf of all of you, small businesses, make sure you get the access that you need, the services that you need. So anything that we can do to help would be, would love to hear from all of you any sort of feedback on how we can better serve all of you. So I want to spend a little time, as Chris mentioned, talking to you a little about what the SBA does, um, and look forward to also engaging with all of you of any questions that you have. At the SBA, we recognize that small businesses are the job creators in this economy, and as Chris had mentioned earlier, two out of three new jobs are created by small businesses. 50% of Americans work or own a small business, so we truly are the foundation of the middle class. When we talk about small businesses and our services at SBA, we talk about the three C's, capital, contracting, and counseling, and I'll talk a bit about each of those. First, in terms of capital, if you look back to October 2008, credit markets were frozen. Good small businesses couldn't get the capital that they needed to sustain their businesses, much less grow or hire. But while at the SBA we actually don't give out loans, we do guarantee loans, so that makes it easier for small businesses to get those dollars. Thanks to two key legislation, pieces of legislation, SBA has been able to provide more support for small business lending. The first legislation was the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act that allowed SBA to reduce or eliminate fees or, and increase guarantees on SBA-supported loans. A year and a half later, the Small Business Jobs Act was passed, which, as many of you know, was one of the most important pieces of legislation that was passed for small businesses in over a decade. 
The Jobs Act continues to make sure that some of these provisions continue to move forward and that lenders ha get the access that they need, and they've been roaring back. The results have been completely undeniable. In fiscal year 2011, SBA had a record year in lending. We were able to give $30 billion to small business owners. And the AAPI small business owner community received over $4 billion in supported lending through our flagship program, 7A and 504. So hopefully some of you have been able to benefit from that. And if not, we'd be happy to talk to you more about that and how you can benefit from some of these programs. The SBA also has programs to help high growth business communities. Our Small Business Investment Company program, which you may have heard SBIC, supported a record $2.5 billion and helped 1,300 small businesses in fiscal year 2011. That's the same program that actually helped businesses like Intel and FedEx get off the ground in their early years. So we have a strong sense of accomplishment around many of the things that we've done here, but at the same time, we know there's a lot more that we can do to get, hands in, uh, get dollars in the hands of small businesses in terms of capital. And that's why we're not waiting for Congress to move forward. We've recently launched a couple new initiatives to help small businesses get the capital that they need now. The first was called CapLines. Hopefully some of you have heard of that and been able to take advantage of that. CapLines focuses on helping small businesses with their, capital, or with their working capital needs. Another program that we've launched is Community Advantage, which is a new pilot which opens the door for mission-based financial institutions to take advantage of our SBA Guarantee Program. We continue to look for more ways to get capital into the hands of small businesses and really urge you to speak out on things that, on any issues that you have or you're hearing in your community. How can we help you better? The second C that I'm going to talk about is contracting. This is something very near and dear to my heart since I spent the last year of my life focused on contracting issues. How many folks out here have been involved in federal contracting in the past? Excellent. Great. As many of you know, it's a very smart thing to do because the federal government is the largest purchaser of goods and services in the entire world. The government spends $500 billion a year procuring goods and services. And small businesses, on average, get nearly $100 billion of that each year. Our whole goal at SBA and our contracting program is to make sure that as much of those dollars get into the hands of small businesses. We run a number of programs to help that. So whether you are a woman-owned small business, a service-disabled woman-owned small business, a 8A firm, which is our program for socially and economically disadvantaged firms, or a firm who resides in one of our hub zones, which is our historically underutilized business program, there are ways that you can benefit from getting more set-asides in terms of federal contracts. And that's what we're here to do to help. Another thing that we work on very closely in our contracting office is to work with our federal agency partners across the entire government. We at the SBA are actually a very small agency that procures a very small amount of money, but across the entire government, there's lots of money to be had, and we make sure that everybody makes small business a priority when they're looking at their procurement, and we worked very closely with the White House to keep deputy secretaries at the most senior levels at every agency accountable to meeting their goals. So that's one of our key focuses. A couple other things that we're doing in terms of contracting to make sure that we keep moving the needle is with our Small Business Jobs Act, which we mentioned was a very important legislation. There was 19 provisions in there related to small business contracting, everything from mentoring programs to increasing grants to making sure that the regulations are written in a way to benefit small businesses. And we're in the process of implementing those. Many of them have already been implemented, but this is an important time to make sure that we continue to move the needle forward. One additional thing, hopefully, that many of you have heard about, the president also instituted what we call quick pay. If you're a federal contractor, which it looks like there's many of you in the room, in the past, you were typically paid by the federal government in around 30 days. Well, the, government, the, the president actually asked all federal agencies to cut that time in half to 15 days. And as a small business, that makes a lot of difference so that you have the capital that you need so you can continue to make more bids and to get more work. So we're very excited about that, and we're looking at more ways to find ways that we can help small businesses like those programs. The last C is counseling. We have 14,000 SBA-affiliated counselors located across the country, and these counselors provide free or low-cost services such as business plan writing or market research. We've seen evidence that companies that use a counselor have a higher chance of success. So we urge you, if you are a small business and haven't visited one of our resource partners, please do. You can visit our website at sba.gov to find a local counselor in your area. I also want to take a quick moment to discuss a couple other key initiatives that the SBA has. 
Many of you may have heard of Startup America, which is a public-private partnership with the goal of supporting high-growth companies. And those are companies that are looking to grow from five people to 100, 500, 5,000 people. At the SBA, we work closely with the Startup America partnership, which is spearheaded by AOL founder Steve Case, to make sure that programs I've mentioned before and others like that are available to high-growth entrepreneurs. The president actually just sent up a legislative package last week focused on helping these entrepreneurs, and you can find out more about that on the White House's website about the, what different agencies are doing to help support Startup America. And lastly, I want to mention our disaster assistance program. We have a program at the SBA to help businesses and homeowners get financing when a natural disaster impacts them in their communities. These are low-interest, long-term loans to help families and communities rebuild in difficult times of disaster. All of these programs I have mentioned are meant to support business owners, small businesses across our country, and it's a top priority to make sure that all of our communities have access to these resources. I mentioned our website previously. We actually recently went through a massive rehaul and revamp of our website, and if you haven't been there recently, I strongly urge you to visit. Again, it's sba.gov, and you can find information about our programs, about local resources, and actually today we recently just launched three new online trainings on how to become a federal contractor. So if you're a federal contractor and you want to learn more about that, how do I win my next contract, we actually just launched three new courses there. So check it out. Hopefully you can find it helpful. And of course, we're open to your feedback on how we can improve that. So excited again to be here today. Hopefully I'll be able to meet a lot of you later on today and look forward to any questions that you have. Thanks so much, Michelle. Um, we're just going to move on now to our next speaker, uh, Portia Wu, who is Senior Policy Advisor for Mobility and Opportunity Policy at the Domestic Policy Council. Um, Portia has previously held positions at the National Partnership for Women and Families, as well as the Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions. Portia? All right. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks for coming out to Washington. I just wanted to talk for a couple of minutes. I work here at the White House on labor and job training issues. And you heard the President and the State of the Union talk about our blueprint for a strong economy in America built to last. And that had four pillars. Um, it relied on manufacturing, investments in our infrastructure, but also we were talking about skills, because that's an investment in our future. Um, you know the President has laid out a lot of initiatives on education, improving our education from all the way from preschool through college and making us, um, we want to be a leader in college completion in the world again. But I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking particularly about workforce training and training for jobs. We know that our economy, as it picks up again, is going to create millions of jobs that need skilled workers. It's not just people with a college degree. There will be a lot of those jobs, too. But I think the estimate is something like 1.6 million jobs in the next few years that will need more than high school but less than a four-year college degree. And that's a lot of the workers that you all will need. I have a question for you. How many of you in this room participate in your local workforce board? Not that many. How many of you have even heard of your lo local workforce board or One Stop? So a little bit more. I think this, this illustrates a little bit of a problem we have. We have 3,000 career One Stops and satellites around this country. Every state and most localities have workforce boards that are made up of majority business people trying to direct the direction of job training in this country. But something that we found in talking with a lot of experts around the country and here, working with our jobs council members, is business feels like they need more engagement. They are saying to us, we need to be sure that people coming out of school, high schoolers need more skills. They don't have the skills they need to walk right into a job. Um, even people working in community college, we want to be sure the skills they are getting there are certifications we understand that we know actually what these people can do. It would be even better if they had some on-the-job training experience wrapped into that education so they're really ready to hit the ground running. So you heard the president in the State of the Union, and I'll just quickly highlight two things we have going on now. He, um, he highlighted a community college initiative and talked about having community colleges um, train people and be partners with businesses. And we will be announcing the details in the coming days um, about more new investments in that arena. But really the idea is to have businesses partner with community colleges so that the programs are developed around your needs. And I will direct you to the TAA Community College grant, Training Grant Program, 
which we've already put out $500 million in one round. The next round of grant applications is going out very soon. It's going to community colleges, but they are supposed to have business partners. So if you work with a community college or your workforce board, that's a good opportunity for you to go to them and say, this is what I think I'm looking for in workers. How can I get in engaged with that? Um, in addition, you'll see in, in coming weeks, we will be rolling out more details around this community college initiative that the president announced in State of the Union. We also have been working with SBA on some ideas on entrepreneurship. We have some pilots with them, the Department of Labor and SBA, about really trying to get entrepreneurs skills and to be sure that community colleges can serve as a resource for people wanting to start their business or to grow their small business. And um, we also have um, a number of grants through um, H-1B, trying to get skilled workers. We have an H-1B grant program that helps them to get on-the-job training. And these higher skilled jobs that, in some cases, businesses are bringing in H-1B workers now, we'd like to find a way to train workers here in the United States to take those jobs. Finally, I want to be sure you're all aware of the, the White House's recent event. We recently launched our Summer Jobs Plus initiative, asking businesses to engage with us in hiring young people this summer. We have a, a real problem facing us now, which is a lot of people between the age of 16 and 24 are just not able to find jobs in this tight labor market. That means we have a whole future generation that are not getting the basic skills they need to know how to engage in the workforce. So if you will go to dol.gov backslash summer jobs, you can learn more about this. The president has asked businesses to step up and commit to hiring or mentoring or providing other kinds of opportunities to a quarter of a million young people this summer. We already have commitments from about 180, for about 180,000 positions. I mean, it's been wonderful, the response we've had from business, but we'd love to see more engagement from the Asian American business community as well. It's an opportunity for young people to be exposed to different kinds of business, business models and experiences. So I'll just say, um, leave it there, because I know we're running out of time, but we are, um, we have done a number of wonderful investments in healthcare and manufacturing, all these arenas where workers need skills to help you fill the jobs you have open, and stay tuned for more. Well, thanks, Portia. Um, so I know you guys uh, have been sitting here patiently. You have had a lot of folks um, talking to you. We, want, we now want to take kind of that second step that Eddie mentioned earlier um, in this conversation and hear from you all. So we'd love to take your questions, love to take your feedback, hear what you're hearing in your community so that we can then do a better job um, here in DC so that these federal programs can uh, be accessed and can reach your, um, your friends, your neighbors, uh, your business owners um, that you frequent. So we've got microphones on either side of um, the room if you'd like to um, Go ahead and, and queue up if any of you have questions. Um, I think we're also taking some questions online. Um, so don't be shy. <laughs> Please, come on up. I think. Hello. Uh, I would like to know if the SBA we website, do you have any bilingual links uh, which, uh, you know, the community people sometimes they have a difficulties understanding all those uh, languages. It's an excellent question, and I know Chris actually works in our Office of Communications and Public Liaison, so I'm sure he can build on this. But yes, we are working very hard to make sure that we make all of our materials accessible in multiple languages. So we have been working to make sure that all of the content that we have on sba.gov is translated. So it is translated in different languages, including um, many Asian languages. Also, one thing we've been working on um, in our district offices is that the actual pamphlets that you see sitting in our district offices are also translated into different languages. How about the online training and the courses, training courses? Are they also in different languages? We're continuing to develop the online courses and expanding upon them. So as of right now, I'm not entirely sure, but I'm happy to get back to you on that. But um, as we continue to build out SBA.gov, it's certainly something that we're um, looking into in terms of making sure that uh, access for all communities is avail to these programs is available. Um, and I'm sorry, we just have a few. Yes, just one more question. Sure. I'm sorry. Do you uh, actually have any collaboration partnership partnership with uh, Asian Chamber of Commerce nationwide, uh, helping them, you know, uh, uh, giving seminars, uh, uh, you know, working with SBA? 
We do have a relationship with the um, Pan-Asian U.S. Chamber of Commerce. We do work closely with them, have been in a number of meetings with them talking about various issues, um, and we're open to any other conversations that they would like to engage us in and how we can better partner with them. Thank you. Hi, this is a question for Michelle uh, about SBA. Uh, I'm a little bit curious about the relationship between SBA and Startup America. And uh, the reason why I ask this, I did check out Startup America, and it seems to be more of a platform for advertisement for so-called sponsors, and not necessarily really offering too much to entrepreneurs. Whereas in SBA.gov, I found that there were quite a bit of resources there for any budding entrepreneur, and you, know, you can actually get real value from that. Uh, so that's one question, and then I also have just one suggestion, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. um, as an entrepreneur, uh, many entrepreneurs who may be looking for VC capital are going to incorporate in Delaware. So one of the problems that I had, and I think many entrepreneurs have, is navigating different state business laws because you have to understand the implications of, for instance, Delaware state business law versus Virginia state business law, Maryland, or whatever. And I think that may be something that can really help uh, budding entrepreneurs if SB SPA were able to provide some sort of resource that says, here are basically what you need to be aware of for these different states, and this is how they interconnect. Great, and thank you for that suggestion. We'll definitely take that back to our team to make sure that we provide that sort of state level um, information for small businesses. Um, in terms of your question about Startup America, I mean, yes, it is a, I'm glad to hear that you find our SBA resources helpful. Um, so that's good to hear. Um, Startup America is something that we are doing as a public par private partnership. So we are, our goal is to make sure that all of our different programs and services that we do have, which are and have had a lot of um, successes with small businesses, we get and we make sure that these high growth entrepreneurs get access to that. So it's a lot about making sure that that's happening. Um, so yes, we're actively involved with that. We continue to push our programs through that, but we will make sure that we continue to work even harder to make sure that that's known as well. So uh, does that mean that it's a platform for visibility or is it actually supposed to be a resource platform? It's both. I mean, it's definitely both. I mean, it's, we want to get the word out that we have a number of resources out there, but it is actually a, a resource platform too where you can access different types of resources. And I'm happy to put you in touch with our folks if you need some better guidance or we can help you better understand the different resources that are available there. Thank you. Pradeep Ganguly from Prince George's County. I think the centerpiece of President's State of the Union address was built to last. Um, am I creating America that's built to last? And within that built to last strategy is the manufacturing strategy that the President talked about. My question probably is for Mr. Lee. Uh, is the U.S. Department of Commerce taking the lead in creating the set, set of tax incentives and other financial assistance programs for job creation and retention in the manufacturing sector? And if so, what are those strategies that you're looking at? Thank you. Uh, yeah, the Secretary of Commerce co-chairs with, with Gene Sperling, the um, White House manufacturing, Office of Manufacturing. Um, as the President outlined, there are many planks, including tax, with, res uh, with respect to uh, the manufacturing strategy. Uh, he alluded to some changes in, in the State of the Union. Uh, obviously, the Secretary of Treasury plays a very, very um, uh, leading role with respect to tax policy, the National Economic Council. But we have a manufacturing cabinet uh, that is co-chaired by Bryson, uh, Secretary Bryson, um, and they, they will consider with the President and the Secretary of Treasury and other cabinet members what the specific um, uh, tax initiatives that, were, that the President outlined in the State of the Union. And they included trying to level the playing field for, to create in, incentives and remove disincentives Absolutely. to, um, to uh, manufacturing in the United States. Um, uh, also with respect to um, you know, certain benefits to uh, locate manufacturing abroad uh, and also creating uh, incentives to uh, bring jobs that were moved abroad back to the United States. Thank you. Thank you. 
We've just got time for just a few more questions. Um, so we'll just go over here. And I apologize to anyone who we won't be able to get to. We'll make sure. Um, please come see me afterwards. I'm happy to talk with you so we can try and get your questions answered after uh, the session. Yeah, please. Sa Sailesh Patel from Asian American Hotel Owner Association. On February 1st, uh, the White House announcement new housing refinancing plan. The government has been diligent and creating solution for struggling homeowners. Why can't government make the same solution for the small business owner association, uh, small business owners? They are struggling for almost from 2007. Even they have a hard time to paying their mortgage. Can you have any plan? Administration have any plan for the business people like they have for the housing? So your question is about. Um particular for small businesses in order to get capital, or is it particular capital. to their house? Oh. Capital, and SBA you know, and I know, uh, we've been knowing uh, 504 and all those SBA, but the right. banks are not lending the real small business because they can't sell those notes to the Wall Street anymore. That means they are, you guys are funding them, but they are not lending the real small business owners. Right, so this is definitely something that we hear a lot and something that we are working actively on. We want to make sure that even though we have our guarantees that the banks are still continuing to make those loans out to small businesses. So we continue to have a number of conversations with banks trying to figure out how can we make sure that we're making things easier for them, how do, what's the barriers that are at play so we can continue to make sure that small businesses get the dollars that they need. Um, as I mentioned, we are also trying to look at other sorts of programs that we have that we can do without legislative action to get more dollars into the hands of small businesses. Um, cap lines and the community advantage I mentioned before, we're also looking at how can we increase small loans to small businesses because we know oftentimes for small businesses it's not the big loan that you need. It's more of the little loans here and there to get that next project, to get hire that next employee. So that's one of the things we're actively looking at. How can we get more small do dollar loans as well? Um, but happy to talk with you more. Um, if we can put you in touch also with our capital access team who can speak as well to that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, anybody in this room have a work with a UL under laboratory testing, safety testing? Underwriters lab? And the laboratory, UL. Uh, my concern is about the UL. You know, we are a resource and development company. And, um, you know, the UL, the process is taking too long. It's, you know, your communication is, you know, it's less communicative and less effective, that I would like to say. Uh, you, you heard about the UL, right? Safety, safety of the product. Well, I'm, I'm familiar with Underwriters Lab as a certifier of, of, uh, of industry products meeting certain standards. Yes. Is that right? You know, yes. Um, UL is a private Yeah, we company. develop the product, but right. product, you know, right. in order to install into the, you know, the other product that we have to have a safety approved you know, before selling to the, uh, for, to the customer. And uh, it is, you know, many people, whoever I know and I work with, they Many people, everybody said UL is, you know, business killer, dream killer. A business killer. Yes, right. sir. One of the project we turned in March last year. Now almost, you know, now it's February this year. Of almost one year, still have not finished UL testing. From the day that we turn in the quote, request for the quote, take a few weeks to get respond back and few weeks for them to assign the engineer and the few week, another few week to, you know, to know the, what they need from us and a few months for them to, to let us know that for the first review of the product. It takes too long. One of our products, we finish development, we have a PO, we cannot ship because the UL had not done yet. But if they really work with us, it takes few months. But it takes too long too long, the process forever. Time is money, especially this time. Time is money. So any way that you can help to, you can help us to improve the UL, the process, and you know, have better communication and better, you know, the process. That's just what my concern. Well, thank you, yeah. thank you. I mean, you've raised a great point. I mean, government needs to operate at the speed of business, and time is money. Um, uh, you know, this president has been extremely committed to uh, streamlining regulation, uh, eliminating regulation that is unnecessary, um, uh, and ensuring that uh, 
our regulators move quickly. I believe this, I'm not sure about the product or whether the standards are FDA based or some so EPA based uh, environmental or, but you know, there are certain health and safety um, requirements uh, that it may be that private un underwriters lab may certify to those standards. Um, I think our, our commitment is to ensure that, uh, that where the federal regulator is involved, that they are moving quickly, that the regulations are sound and that they be eliminated if they're unnecessary, and that there be uh, timely removal. Uh, you know, obviously there's always room for improvement, but this is something that's very high on the, on the president's list because we have to move quickly. Thank you. I think we have time for just one more question, so we'll go ahead on this side here and Thank you very much. My name is Elizabeth Chang. I'm from Frederick, Maryland. I'm the executive director for an Asian American Center of Frederick. Um, I will have two comments, and I'll both addressed to Michelle and also Pasha. First of all, the, we are a nonprofit organization, and I think it's time to look at nonprofit as the next social entrepreneur for changes. You know, we are here to do services and products, and we want to be cost efficiency and, and that sort of thing. So I think that I'd like to see FBA will put some focus in terms of developing integration, collaboration with nonprofit organization, so that you know that the, the new immigrants communities will have a chance also to get into um, more to the revenue driven you know, that type of uh, project. Second is that, thank you, Eddie, for having this uh, event, too. Uh, Pasha, it's a thing, I think you'll like to hear what I have to say. Uh, most recently, Frederick, Maryland, you know, in Frederick County, we have ready to meet the true collaboration in a real sense. We have um, interpreter training. And how did that happen? Workforce development, you know, and also the community college and um, the, help, the hospitals and myself. Mm -hmm. And frankly, it's because my communities lost jobs, they lost 200, 300 jobs from BP Solar. And these are bilingual folks with doctors and nurses in the, in the back, you know, of their background, and yet they couldn't find jobs. So, so we, we work with them, but the thing is that I like to, to say that it's not, they are not reaching out to us. That's why many of us do not really know the workforce development. We are the one reaching to them. They are very busy helping you know, the Mer American to get jobs, which is very good. But again, they need to reach out to the communities and know the souls, know the heartbeat, know the pulse of the communities, and where can we make the, you know, the job you know, more. So you know, with that, you know, it's just great. You know, we, we, we brought in um, with basically 30 people being trained for the first time in my county as you know, them professionally trained interpreter. Again, the language skill, those are very important. We need to look at community assets. We're not here to just keep asking for help. We have skills, we have cultural skill, we have language skill. We need to ask SBA and also workforce development to help those, help the communities, our, our first, second generation, our new way for immigrants, our Burmese, our Bhutanese, and Nepalese, you know, that those you know, come after the Chinese and the Korean and so forth. Those new immigrants, emerging immigrants, really need a great deal more job training. But we need them to reach out to us. And last, we need to be at the table for funding. We cannot just go out there and wait for them and say that we will partner with you. I know we make them look good to bring the numbers to you that they serve, but we are the one that do most of the work. Thank you. Well, thank you for that comment. And I think it, it highlights what um, it's a challenge for all the workforce boards now. You know, budgets are, budgets are getting trimmed. Millions of people are flooding into their offices. You know, we've seen a huge spike in what the people they need to serve. So it is a challenge, but thank you for highlighting how it can work and also what we need to do to improve. Perfect. And thank you guys so much. Um, so I hope you guys found this information useful. We just wanted to provide you an overview, a snapshot of the many, 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 many programs that the federal government's um, working on to try and help your businesses uh, and businesses in your community and people in your community. Um, I'm going to turn things over back to Eddie, and I just want to take a quick second and say thank you to the panelists for joining us Can and for providing some input. Can we ask one key question, please? All of this is great, but you know, you're sitting in the White House, the budgets are being cut, and who's affected? Small businesses. And who's going to have to lay off people? Small businesses. Nobody's answering that question. Can you help us with that? I don't want to close my business. The government is cutting their budget. Every day I get a call, another project's being cut. How are you going to answer that? So let me take a stab at that, the million dollar question. Um, that's what we do every day at the SBA. I think now everyone's sensitive to this is difficult times. Everyone's taking 
having to take cuts here, right and left, not only the federal government, but the private sector, and we know, most importantly, small businesses are. And that's exactly what we do every day to make sure that small businesses still get the access and resources that they need. That's why we have the programs that we have. If there's specific things that you're not getting that you feel like you need to get, we welcome your comments and your feedback. That's what we're here to provide you with. If it's specific to capital, if it's specific to counseling, let us know. We're here to help. Let's give our panelists another round of applause. Well, uh, I want to introduce uh, the next speaker who's going to be giving our closing remarks. And before I do so, I want to say that this is just the beginning of a conversation. It's not, you know, it's, this is certainly not the end of it. And we've heard you loud and clear. We've heard your concerns, we've heard your questions, and we've heard your encouragements. But this is just the beginning. And so what we ask for you is to keep us accountable and stay in touch with us so that we can continue to work from here to help you. The President has said this time and time again, that this is a make or break moment for the middle class. And we certainly agree with that. But that solution doesn't happen just with the White House or folks here in D.C. It happens with all of us around this community, around this country, coming together to find real solutions. And the person that uh, is at the head of that business council uh, here at the White House is uh, a man by the name of Ari Matusiak, who is the executive director of the White House Business Council. He is uh, one of the administration's main vehicles for en uh, engaging the private sector and civil leaders on jobs in the economy. Uh, he is a tireless fighter for businesses, and this is a man who will fight in this battle for all of us, for this AAPI community, but also our business leaders. And I'm very delighted to bring him up. He also happens to be a, a diehard Green Bay Packers fan, which I don't blame him too much for. Uh, and we, we certainly give him our condolences. But uh, for the most part, uh, uh, we want to just thank you all. But I want to bring up Ari Mutuziak for the closing remarks. Thank you. Yeah, last night was tough. It's hard to see. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ari Matusiak. Uh, thank you all for letting me take a couple minutes to join you in uh, what I'm sure has been a productive and exciting afternoon. Certainly, if Eddie's doing it, uh, it's uh, it's going to be well done. Um, I can just give you want to give you a little bit of a background about what I do here uh, at the White House and with the administration, and then how that relates to. Uh, what we hope to be able to do with all of you. Um, I run something, as Eddie mentioned, called the White House Business Council. Uh, it is effectively our vehicle for getting our people outside of Washington and engaging with business leaders and civic leaders like yourselves to make sure really that we're doing two things. First, that we're getting feedback about what we as an administration can be doing more of or in some cases less of to move the needle on jobs and our long-term economic competitiveness. And second, to make sure that business leaders like yourselves are getting access to information about the resources and programs that are in place so that you can continue to move your companies forward to scale your firms and to grow and create jobs. Uh, the President said in this room um, last April that he wanted to a group of about 150, 160 uh, senior administration officials, cabinet members, White House officials, senior sub-cabinet officials, that he didn't want them, he didn't want to see them as much anymore, um, which I think they were a little surprised by. But he, uh, he said that we needed to get out of D.C. and make sure that we were hearing directly from the folks who were the job creators around this country. And since that time, I'm actually very proud to say that uh, our administration, senior administration officials have had over 550 meetings in all 50 states and in over 200 communities. And you don't hear a lot about that uh, because the goal wasn't to turn it into a media event. The goal was to make it an opportunity for us to get the feedback that could shape policy. And that is, in fact, what has happened. When the President put out the American Jobs Act in September and gave the speech to the Joint Session of Congress, many of the elements in the Jobs Act were, uh, were contained in the conversations that we had with business leaders like yourselves around the country. Similarly with the State of the Union. And in the announcements that have, and the announcements that have transpired over the uh, prior weeks. Uh, announcements like 
our work to make sure that we're facilitating uh, and growing our exports through travel and tourism and addressing visa requirements. That came directly from business leaders in Miami and in Las Vegas and in, and in, uh, and in California, among other places. Uh, similarly, with uh, the President's proposal to reorganize government to consolidate uh, the eight, to consolidate the six agencies that deal with trade and small business into one entity to make sure that we have uh, go from the spaghetti chart that nobody can really grasp and understand in terms of where to go to get access to the resources they need to one place, to one website, to one phone number, to one, uh, to one department. Uh, those have been the, the kinds of things that we have heard all across the country that have resulted in actual substantive policy changes here. Uh, and it's a direct result of the input that we get. So uh, conversations like this, meetings like this, really do matter. We take them incredibly seriously here. The President has uh, made it plain to us that this is how we get our ideas and that this is how we move our agenda forward. And I think we have seen the result of that over the last uh, months. Um, I know many of you all have probably already heard about and read about the jobs numbers that came out on Friday, but we've had 23 straight months of private sector job growth. Um, we are uh, moving forward in a way that is indicative of us going in the right direction, but we have uh, much more to do and much more work ahead. And so that is actually why um, I am very excited to go to work every day, because what that means is that the work is not done and that we get to continue engaging with folks like yourselves to help us uh, to help us continue to advance the America's economic agenda. So let me just boil that down a little bit more concrete terms because it's a little bit high altitude. Um, so uh, we do a few things here. Um, we continue to go out around the country and have these meetings with business leaders uh, like yourselves. If you want to host one or uh, in your community bring a group of business leaders together and have a conversation directly with us, we'd love to do that. Um, if you want to participate in one when we roll through town, uh, we'd love to have you uh, be a part of it. Um, we, have, um, uh, we also bring people here uh, much, like, much like this or similar to this where we focus entirely on jobs in the economy and have um, uh, deep dive conversations with senior administration officials about our long-term economic competitiveness and do it city by city. So if you're from, um, if you're in town, or is anybody here from Columbus? No? Well, you, you don't come. Well, if you're sticking around, if you're from Columbus and you want to hang out in town, we'll be, we have a group of Columbus business leaders here coming in tomorrow, you're welcome to join. Uh, you know, and if you're going to stay for all week and you're from Seattle, you can come in on Thursday. If you're from Detroit, we're going to be here. They're going to be here on Friday. Uh, but the point is that these are opportunities for us to get uh, those inputs directly. Um, we also are doing a series of forums around the country focused on entrepreneurs in cities. Um, we know from all the data that entrepreneurship and specifically new starts and high growth companies are where the bulk of job creation is taking place. And so we are looking at ways to make sure that we're connecting the dots in uh, city centers so that we are getting the, uh, getting the resources to the people in communities that can have the most robust impact on job creation in some of the places where we need to have it most. So we had an event in New York on Friday uh, focused on women entrepreneurs uh, in the city. It was uh, a resounding, um, uh, an energetic uh, event where about 400 women entrepreneurs came together, uh, got the information that they needed, but were also connected in a very concrete way to mentors in, uh, in small conversations. They were introduced to resources through an expo of public and private sector resources to make sure that we're bridging the gap uh, so that people are aware and able to move forward with their companies. Um, so we are going to continue to do those kinds of things, but, uh, and you are always welcome to participate in them, and we will make sure that you get looped into the information about these events as they come forward. But for us, it's, uh, you know, events are events. They, they happen, and then they end, and then people leave, and they say one thing or another about them. Either it was worth their time, or it could have been more worth their time. Uh, but for us, it's also really important as we have this conversation across the country that the conversation 
across the country changes and becomes much more focused on results and solutions and less about rhetoric and about who's right and wrong. Uh, and that's really where you come in. So to the extent that we are um, communicating with you in a way that, that resonates in terms of what this administration's economic uh, agenda is and what this president believes in terms of how best to move the country forward on jobs and the economy, um, please share that. Let others know. Uh, if you think that there are things that we need to be talking more about or more effectively about, let us know so that we can do that. But ultimately, you are the leaders in your communities. You are the ones who people turn to and listen to and ask advice of, um, much more so than they do with any of us who might visit for a day but inevitably have a plane ticket back here. Uh, sometimes we are more excited about that than others, but most of the time, we, we're, we're, all of us are often most excited when we get to travel across the country. So usually the outbound trip is more exciting to us than the one back here. Uh, but, um, but seriously, uh, you all are the ones who, who can carry the water in your communities and who people turn to. And so we need you to be the voices about what it is that we can be doing and about making sure that people around the country understand that this is an administration that is very serious about job creation and very focused on solutions. So. Uh, we look to your advice and input, and we also uh, need your help in getting that message out. Um, in terms of communicating with us uh, more broadly, we will make sure that, that you get on our lists and that you are uh, robustly aware of what's going on. Uh, we have our conference calls and our e-newsletters and all of that. We also have an online forum. Uh, for business leaders and entrepreneurs to help shape a conversation and meet one another. And that's at www.whitehouse.uservoice.com. Um, Whitehouse.uservoice.com. But I'll make sure that Eddie gets that information out to you. And that's just another way for people to connect and share with one another as they think about strategies for how to grow and scale their companies. So. Um, we are, uh, I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to, to talk with you all a little bit today. Um, but I'll just close by saying that there is no conversation topic that is more important here uh, than making sure that every American who wants to have a job can have a job. And to make sure that every business owner and entrepreneur who is trying to grow their companies has the tools and resources and the freedom from obstacles and barriers to do so. So we are always going to be on that hunt. We are always interested in input about how to be better uh, equipped to accomplish that, uh, to accomplish those goals. And for that, we need all of you and therefore depend on staying in touch with all of you. So it's not just that we like to send you a blast email. Uh, that's not how we look at it. We look at it as a way to have an ongoing conversation, as one way to have an ongoing conversation. Uh, and so we rely on, uh, on you all to, be, uh, to pick up the other end of that and to keep us uh, in the loop. So with that, I'll just say I look forward to staying in touch. Um, and, uh, and thank you all very much again for joining us here at the White House. Thank you, Ari. And uh, that brings us to the end of our program. Uh, before I release you to the festivities of this afternoon, uh, let me just say that uh, speaking on behalf of the White House, we hear you and we hear your stories and we hear the urgency in your voices as you speak. And we know that you are at the front line in terms of the economy. It's your small businesses and your businesses that are most at stake when our economy doesn't do well. And so when, I, when we hear your concerns, that just reminds me of why I come here every single day and do the work that I do, and why this White House initiative on AAPIs comes to their work every day and do the work that they do. And so the moment that these uh, needs stop, that's when my job goes away. But until we continue to have more and more concerns and more and more needs for more resources, we are going to continue to come here every single day and fight for you. So my ask to all of you is to keep us accountable. I have a whole stack of uh, business cards that I'm happy to give away after this talk, and I will order another batch as I see fit. Um, I sent my mom the first batch, so I'm running out really quickly. Uh, but let me just say that it is, we have 
every single time I see our clips, our news clips, and we, see, we hear of another business leader or a business that's not doing so well because of the economy, that's another reminder of the urgency that we have throughout this country to keep standing up, to keep fighting for all of you, and to keep being your voices. So please be encouraged as you go out. I know that this is just a small portion of the conversation that needs to happen, but that conversation is going to continue. And as long as I'm here, I will come to your businesses or to your roundtables. We will bring these White House officials to your roundtables or to your conversations to make sure that we are reaching you at a local level. So please be in touch with me. Let me know how it could be a further help to all of you and to keep on being your voices. Uh, with that, as you all may know, this brings us to the end of our Lunar New Year celebration. And uh, this is the Year of the Dragon. It's a very important year for all of us, and, and so I know very well the importance of what this uh, holiday means for all of us. I have sat before my parents many a day with the uh, red envelope in hand, uh, asking them what I can do. Uh, I think asking myself what I can do to better myself. I remember that my parents would come with me with these envelopes, and, but the thing that actually is most important about the uh, Lunar New Year holiday in my home is that my parents would make my brother and, my, and me sit down and tell them all the things that we plan to do that next year. And that we had to put a whole list and an essay together and give it to our parents before they gave us that red envelope. <laughs> and, and, and so I know that with our community, this is a moment for us to think about our resolutions moving forward. What can we do better as a community? What can we do better as a country? And this is a conversation that we need to have is we all have a stake here today. It's not just the president. It's not just the people here in Washington, D.C. It's all of us that have to sit back and, and sorry, reflect on what we can do to make this country and this community a better place. And so I want to tip my hat to all of you because you are the unsung heroes of our community. You all do the hardest work that I can possibly imagine. You all spend the extra hours past the opening hours to make sure that your businesses function and that your family is able to strive and thrive and become successful. So with that, I want to close by saying thank you to all of you. Thank you for all the work that you do. And on behalf of this administration, we want to engage you and continue to thank you for all the work that you do. So appreciate it. Everybody, we also we're going to have our reception in the in the Department of Education. If you turn to the back of your agenda, you'll find instructions to get there. the uh, The reception will begin promptly at five o'clock, so please make your way over there now. Again, the instructions are in the back of your agendas.